teach us all night long. Okay, all right. Okay, so here we go again. Everybody here, can you guys hear on the microphones? Are people saying they can hear me because I lost my window? Okay. So DNA is classified as a nucleic acid. This is the name of it, the specific name of it, deoxyribonucleic acid. I want you to memorize that. Just write it over 20 times over again. That is the basic chemical classification of the type of molecule that DNA is in its entirety. So a nucleic acid is a polymer of nucleotides. And you hear this said a lot, but what is a polymer? And by the way, keep in mind, always specify that nucleotides are pronounced nucleotides, as in tides, like the laundry detergent, All right? Because there's also a nucleoside, which is slightly different. And we're not going to go into what nucleosides are. That's for, like, you know, biochem. But they're out there, and we want to make sure that you don't confuse them with nucleosides. These are nucleotides. So a polymer is a large molecule that is made up of a chain of smaller subunit molecules. We call those smaller subunit molecules within a polymer monomers. Think about it this way. Mono means one, or singular. Poly means many. Okay? So the mer part you can think of as meaning molecule. So a polymer is many mers or many monomers all linked together. And then here's the cartoonish representation of DNA that I introduced you to with the first lecture. So remember, it has this kind of, it looks like a train track that's all twisted, you know, and kind of this fancy double helix shape. Well, it has, people can still hear me, right? Okay, so it has the rails, and then it has the railway ties connecting the two rails. That's why we say it's double-stranded, all right? So within the context of this cartoonish diagram, what I have illuminated for you in color are the actual nucleotides. So here it comes. These are the nucleotides right here. Notice that the red is always in sharing the same railway tie as the yellow. And the blue is always sharing the same railway tie as the green. That's important. OK? Also notice that the railway ties are always the exact same length. So therefore, the width of the molecule always stays the same. So here they are kind of all separated out. And notice that the nucleotides only go about halfway or real more like 2 thirds or 1 third of the way through the tie. And that the tie, or that the uh, nucleotide encompasses both the tie of the railroad track and its rail. So now we're going to look at the actual molecule and its chemical structures, the nucleotides, that is. So here's a phosphate. This is what a phosphate looks like. This is its chemical formula. You probably heard of phosphate talked about in physiology class. Here's what a phosphate really looks like. It's connected to a, a deoxyribose. Deoxyribose is a pentose sugar, meaning it has five carbons. All of the carbons are labeled according to a specific number. This is the fifth carbon. This is the fourth carbon. This is the third carbon, the second carbon, the first carbon. Sometimes it's called referred to as five prime carbon. This is the four prime carbon. This is the three prime carbon. This is the two prime carbon. This is the one prime carbon. Why? Because we say so. It's just arbitrary. It's man-made. The reason that we do it is because it's a very handy way to keep track of how these monomers, these nucleotides, are arranged within the molecule. Okay? It's just used to keep track of things. And so the relevance of it we'll talk about shortly. But the five prime and the three prime carbons are very, very important in understanding how these monomers are oriented, OK? So now this deoxyribose is connected to some sort of a base. And we call these bases more specifically nitrogenous bases. Say that three times over again, nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base. And now we connect the nucleotides together 
So we connect this deoxyribose to a phosphate, which is connected to another deoxyribose, which is connected to base number two. And now we're going to do the same thing. Notice how they always connect to one another. As in terms of the carbons, the three prime carbon of this deoxyribose is connected to a phosphate, which is then connected to the five prime carbon of this deoxyribose, which is then connected to base number three. You can see what we're kind of doing here. We're, this will become the rails, and these will become the ties. So here is the cartoonish diagram overlying the really complex molecular diagram. Here it comes again, because this is base number two. It represents a different nucleotide, which gets a different color. Here's base number three, still a different nucleotide, because it has a different, with a, a different base on it, that it gets its own specific color. So this is the connection between the molecular diagram and the cartoonish diagram that looks like building blocks. All right. So now we're going to take this string of nucleotides and we're going to align it with another strand to make a double-stranded DNA polymer, a very short piece of it. So there it is. It's going the other direction. Now look at this right here. Look at the five, look at the carbons. Right here, and do my pen tool. Look at how the carbons are arranged. It goes five to three. Five to three. On this strand, I have to go back and reverse them for you. This, this took a lot of cutting and pasting, by the way, guys. This goes in the three to five. Three to five. Three to five. Three to five. And you can see that it's actually just the absolute, it's almost like if you took this one and you flipped it around so it's completely in the reverse direction. So these strands are going in opposite directions, and we keep track of what direction they're going in, either north or south, based on the, this 5 to 3 or 3 to 5 carbons. Again, it's just, book, it's just bookkeeping. It's nothing more complex than that. It's just keeping track of which way they're arranged. And they happen to be arranged in opposite directions. So let's draw in our building blocks to make things really nice and simple now. Here we go. And now the opposite building blocks. Here's the other rail and the other part of the ties. Notice again, we have the same pattern emerge where a red nucleotide is always paired with a yellow, and a blue nucleotide is always paired with a green. And then here on the other side, a green is on this side, and so a blue is matching it on the opposite side. Also notice that the reds are always longer than the yellow, and the greens are always longer than the blue. That has to do with the shape of the nitrogenous bases, which is what we're going to get to next. Now, I know I'm going kind of fast, but it's because I want to make sure you guys get out of here on time. You can always go back and, and stop and start the video, and every time you get to the point where you're like, what? Just stop the video and think about it, email me a question if you have it. If you're thinking about a question at that specific moment, don't hesitate to send off an email. All right, so let's look at these nitrogenous bases. So this is just a nucleotide I'm showing for you. This is a nucleotide. Yes, we know that, Matt. This is a base. You know that too, Matt. We call it a nitrogenous base because they contain nitrogen. Now let's talk about how we classify these nitrogenous bases. We call them either purines, and here are the two purines that DNA possesses. This is adenine, and then this is guanine. Notice that they both contain two rings. One ring is kind of a pentagon, and the other ring is a hexagon. 
They have slightly different structures to them, but they both contain nitrogen and they both have double rings. So they're pretty similar in that respect. And so we classify them as purines. This is the way I think about it. Big molecule, small name. Big molecule, meaning it has two rings, small name, adenine and guanine. You just have to memorize that. And then the other type, the other flavors that they come in are classified as pyrimidines. Pyrimidines are smaller. As you might guess, they only contain one ring. So here is thymine. I couldn't fit thymine in, so I had to tilt it over a little bit because it was colliding with its phosphate. And then here is cytosine. They look very similar to one another, but they are slightly different. They are very obviously similar in the respect that they only have a single ring. So now let's put the blocks over it. So, ah, here's our longer red and greens. This represents why the, the reds and the greens are a little bit longer than the yellows and the blues. All right? And remember our bonding pattern, we said you only have a red with a yellow and a blue with a green. I guess that must also mean that you can only have a purine paired with a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine paired with a purine within a specific railroad, railroad tie, right? Now, let's go back to our big diagram here. We're going to reverse these bases. Let's draw in the blocks. Well, i got to do the three fives right side up again. Okay, so now here's the blocks again. So right here, we're going to have double ring, single ring, right? Big nitrogenous base, small nitrogenous base. Small nitrogenous base, big nitrogenous base. Big nitrogenous base, small nitrogenous base. So it's, it, it is even more specific than always having a purine or a big nitrogenous base with a pyrimidine or a small nitrogenous base. More specifically, you always, always, always have the purine guanine associated with the pyrimidine cytosine. And you always have the purine adenine always, always, always associated with the um, pyrimidine thymine. Did I say pyrimidine adenine? It's a purine. Right? Adenine and guanine are purines, cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. Big name, small molecule. Little name, big molecule. Okay, so T and A are always lined up so that they always all, always form the same railroad railroad tie. Ugh, it's a tongue twister. And then guanine and cytosine are always paired up so they form the same railroad tie. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in the magic green ingredient that keeps them always linked together in the same railroad tie in what is known as complementary base pairing. These little dots that I wrote on are a special type of chemical interaction called a hydrogen bond. Now some of you recall what a hydrogen bond is. Some of you learned what a hydrogen bond is and you forgot what a hydrogen bond is. I can relate to that. There's many times in my life where I've learned something and forgot it and learned it and forgot it. I just know it now because I teach it for a living. Um, but, you know, this isn't a chemistry class, and so I'm not going to go back and rehash what they actually are. But just keep in mind they're not actually bonds. You can put these in quotation marks. They're interactions, but they're very strong interactions that make these very, very much like each other. All right, and they like each other in very specific ways because these hydrogen bonds occur between them in very specific ways. So they kind of match up like puzzle pieces because of these hydrogen bonds in very specific ways. So you always have cytosine paired with guanine and uh, uh, thymine paired with adenine. So let's draw in the building blocks. Here are the building blocks. 
here, and now let's draw them in here on our very cartoonish spiral staircase diagram. There they are. Okay, that's all it's trying to symbolize. And then here's, this is out of the uh, Barry and Workman book. Again, here is the three to five rail, so to say. Okay, within here you have three, five, three, five, three, five, three, five, three, five, three, five, okay? Deoxyribose sugar, phosphate, deoxyribose sugar, phosphate, deoxyribose sugar, phosphate. It's all assumed that all of that is in this tie, this railroad rail, rather. And then coming off of the rail, you have, or coming off the rail, yep, you have the railroad ties, which are made up of specific nitrogenous bases, which are always complementarily base paired in a very specific way due to very specific hydrogen bonds. And because you always have a pyrimidine, okay, big name, small molecule, and a purine, small name, big molecule, always within the same tie, the ties are always the same length. And so this molecule, this DNA molecule, always has a uniform width to it. And then on the other side, they're arranged in the opposite direction. And we keep track of that opposite direction by saying that this is the 3 to 5 direction compared with this being the arranged in the opposite orientation, the 5 to 3 direction. Or actually, we would say this is the 3 to 5 direction, and then this is the 5 to 3 direction. Anyways, what's important is that they are opposites. They are oriented in the opposite direction, and we keep track of that opposite direction with uh, numbering the carbons on the deoxyribose sugars. So here, here we have fun with building blocks again. There they are. It's the same thing that we've been talking about all along. So here's more on the structure of DNA right here. Um, it's a double helix. And so it turns out that um, what happens, the way it wraps around itself is that you always create a structure where you have a major groove or this really wide gap, and then you have a minor groove, which is a very narrow gap. And so it alternates from a minor groove to a major groove to a minor groove to a major groove. Think about this. You know those little barber poles? Are the stripes, the red and white stripes, are they ever the same length as one another? Usually the red stripes are thinner than the white stripes, right? It's like that. It's like, so you think about them as having these spiral grooves as that go along, okay? One groove is bigger than the other. And why does it form that way? Who cares? That's what biochemists do for a living. They worry about, they stay up at night worrying about stuff like that. It just happens. And, uh, you know, the reasons why it happens has to do um, with the way in which these different groups interact with each other chemically. And, you know, this was all deduced by Watson and Crick and Marilyn Franklin, which is a very interesting story in itself, which we don't have time to get into. Um, basically what happened is um, Dr. Franklin <laughs> did all the important work with X-ray crystallography. And actually someone in her lab, I, I believe, uh, uh, got a uh, first-hand look at her uh, results and then took it over to Watson and Crick. Um, and Watson and Crick then used that information to deduce the double helix structure of DNA. And they went ahead and they published it in Nature in 1953. And they ended up getting all the credit for it. They got the Nobel Prize for it. And then Rosalind Franklin died early, I believe in like her 40s, because she was an x-ray crystallographer. And back in that, those days, they didn't use the protections that they should have when dealing with x-rays. And so um, it's kind of an example of um, um, a, a very, very talented, very, very uh, genius uh, female in science who was uh, shortchanged. Um, uh, and uh, basically had her work stolen from her, and she died before she could ever get recognized for it in her lifetime. So it's, it's a sad story, but it's a telling story. So now let's talk about DNA replication. Um, the way it works is that when it comes to uh, 
replicate this molecule, the two strands are temporarily separated from one another. And you can do this because remember those hydrogen bonds that connect the A to the T and the C to the G are not really bonds, they're interactions. So it's almost like pulling apart magnets, okay? You can reattach the magnets to one another, but you can also easily pull them apart. So the two strands are separated from one another by very, very specific enzymes, okay? There's enzymes that, uh, and we're not going to go into what they're called and their specific names because all that will do will just clutter our minds for the time being. We can go back and learn what their names are when we thoroughly understand uh, the big picture and see the forest through the trees. But there's special enzymes that go and separate the two strands. And then we have another enzyme, which is the more commonly known of all the enzymes involved in this, called DNA polymerase. And DNA polymerase goes and matches a new complementarily or complementary nucleotide to this nucleotide and then matches another complementary nucleotide to this already formed nucleotide and then it goes on and on and on and on in either direction on either strand. So, but remember the strands are oriented in opposite directions so this strand over here is being replicated in this direction and then this strand over here is being replicated in the opposite direction, all at the same time, and actually at multiple points. Oh, did the, the session end? Or anyway, so it's almost done, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking, okay. But eventually we will get timed out. So I can't talk on forever. So just be reassured with that. I will be forced to get off soon. So let's think about it in a way that might be a little bit more, uh, uh, requires us to not try to, I don't know, move the pictures in our own mind. Uh, so here we have the three to five strand, okay? And, um, and it's actually, they're all twisted around each other. So here's, kind of trace it with your eyes. Here's the five to three strand, and then here's the three to five strand. Everybody follow me right here? Actually, let me just draw it right out, and then I'll erase it. So here's the five to three strand, okay? And then on the other side, let's do bright blue. Very patriotic. Here's the opposite original strand, okay? Now watch what happens. DNA polymerase gets in here and it goes zoom, making a new strand with complementary base pairing with the original strand. And this new strand is also going in the opposite direction as this original strand. And then the DNA polymerase on the other side is doing the same thing, but in the opposite direction because the opposite strand is going in a different direction. So zoom, there it goes from the bottom up, okay? And so what happens is, is you have two identical strands, and within each identical strand, there is one strand from the old original DNA molecule and another new brand spanking new strand made by the DNA polymerase. And then the same situation is going over here on the other side. So you have two identical new double-stranded DNA molecules with each of them containing the original silver strands and a brand new baby blue strand. Okay? So, that's what is referred to as semi-conservative replication. And on purpose, I wrote the semi-conservative as a combination of blue and gray or silver, where the silver represents the original old strand and the blue represents the new strand. That's what's meant by semi-conservative. Remember, conservative means things stay the same. Semi means sort of, but not all, not quite. Okay, semi means it's sort of conservative, meaning only one of the strands in the new strand is the original. 
the other one is new, but it's not completely new because because of complementary base pairing, it's a complete match of what used to be there. All right, and so here's a picture of DNA polymerase. It actually looks like a finger. It's important that you know, and I'm just going to try to plant the seed of knowledge now, that DNA polymerase has the ability to go back and proofread mistakes and actually rip out uh, base pairs or nucleotides that are matched with each other incorrectly, which is really pretty cool. It's a major, major, major protection for our cells against making errors when our cells replicate their um, DNA before they get ready to divide. And it's actually the getting ready to divide is what we're going to talk about in the next lecture, okay, which is going to be about mitosis. All right, we're done.